Hello everyone and welcome to today's session about the case competition in collaboration with Association of African Business Schools. I would like to introduce you to the presenters. We are Dr. Michael Goldman. He teaches at the University of San Francisco Sport Management Master's Program. He also holds an, an adjunct faculty role with the Gordon Institute of Business Science in Johannesburg. And he's the editor-in-chief of the Emerald Publishing's Emerging Market Case Studies. James Hobbs, he is commissioned lead for the cases at ML Publishing. He started in November 2021 and he works in acquisitions for the case for women, the case journal and emerging market case studies and licensed product clients. The agenda for today is introductions. And then Dr. Michael is going to present on how to write a case study. James is going to cover MCS and then submitting to Emerald. We're going to cover some questions that come through and then we'll close the session. So during the session, if you've got any questions, please put them through the question um, options and we'll go through them afterwards. Thank you and Dr. Michael, over to you. Well, thank you, Talita. Good afternoon. Um, hello, everyone, uh, wherever you may be across the continent. Uh, delighted to spend some time with you. Uh, let me share a couple of slides here. Uh, there we go, sharing. Great, I think you can see that now. And uh, James Talita, let me know if uh, my slide is not uh, showing for you. Uh, so good afternoon, uh, Michael Goldman. As Talita said, I'm based here in California at the moment. The sun is shining, it's good. And I, I hear that all is well uh, in a bunch of places across the continent as well. Uh, born and bred in South Africa, I have a role at the Gordon Institute of Business and Science in Johannesburg and have been fortunate to spend some time teaching in Kenya and Uganda and Nigeria and a few other places, um, uh, Cairo, uh, across the continent. And so very pleased to spend some time today talking about case studies in Africa and this really important relationship we have with the African Association of Business Schools as Emerald Publishing and the exciting opportunity uh, for many of you to write cases and submit cases for this competition. I guess let me start at that point uh, because I, I think it's really important in a session like this to, to talk about why we're doing this. Uh, and, you know, Emerald Publishing has been driving emerging market case studies now for a number of years. and We're delighted with the quality and a number of cases that we've been able to put on instructors and students desks around the world from emerging markets. But to be fair, many of those emerging market cases are not telling the stories of some of Africa's most interesting businesses, most interesting entrepreneurs, most interesting family-run organizations. And so there's a massive opportunity that we are very keen to support and invest in more cases and new cases about interesting organizations that are shaping the way business happens across our continent. There's obviously much variety and variance across Africa. Um, and we know that the stories in East Africa are different to the stories in West Africa are different to some of the most interesting stories in Southern Africa. And, and so we really wanna challenge us today to think about what are those additional stories that we can use to teach theory, to teach frameworks and content in some of the best business schools around the world, but also at the same time to profile the great work that our managers and entrepreneurs and leaders are doing in organizations across the continent. It requires partnership. And I know for many of my business school colleagues across Africa, the relationship with business is sometimes not where it should be. And so one of the points we want to emphasize today is the need for business academics, for business school profs to connect with alumni, to connect with executive education students, to connect with business people so that we're able to capture these stories in a trusted relationship and publish them so that we make those organizations a little bit more famous around the world, but bring those stories into the classroom. So that students in Singapore or Shanghai or New York or even here in San Francisco can learn about business by thinking about uh, all the interesting businesses across the African continent. Students in these classrooms around the world want to learn more about business in Africa. They recognize that business is happening that the perception of the continent is shifting, continues to shift, 
and that business and enterprise and economic activity across the continent uh, is changing the way many around the world are seeing Africa. So there's a fabulous opportunity here to contribute to that. And so that's really where I want to kick off today is to challenge us to do this hard work of writing these cases and submitting them and winning awards. But for what purpose? And the purpose I want to remind you about is to put these great stories, great businesses, great lessons on the desks of these students and instructors and other managers around the world. It's a great way for us to build our careers in universities, in business schools across the continent, uh, but at the same time to broaden the kind of education that students are getting around the world. So that's really where I want to focus some of our comments today as we head into some of the nitty gritty of how you develop a world class case study from Africa about Africa that can win these kinds of awards. My first few slides up here at the top uh, today are about this idea of real impact. It's a concept that Emerald has invested quite a lot of resources and thinking and time about how do we do research, including case research, that has a greater impact than just a publication. Now, we know as academics, as scholars, uh, we wear multiple hats and we have to do a bunch of things every day. And one of those is this idea of research and publishing and publish or perish. But there's more that we can do with that research work that we have to do anyway. And the idea of real impact is thinking about the publication being the first step. That doing the research and submitting it and getting it peer reviewed and going through those processes and then getting the hit for our resume right uh, and we get applause on campus and we get something else to add to our cv but that's just the start real impact is when the work that we've done that we have published makes a broader impact on the stakeholders and society that matter to us the most so students and other organizations and managers and policy makers in, in, in economies and, and regional economic setups across the continent. We can have such a broader impact when the work we do is seen by and used by a larger number of stakeholders. That's where I'm so excited about case studies because by default, great quality published peer-reviewed case studies, many of which win these kinds of awards that we do with ABS, are the case studies that are used in classrooms around the world, do influence the way managers do what they do. And as we, as we educate the next generation of business leaders, we want them to be shaped with the right kind of stories, the right kind of frameworks, the right kind of science to be able to make better decisions. The work we do in case research has that opportunity to have a much more direct impact. Now, that doesn't mean that the other research we, we do doesn't have that opportunity. It certainly does. And this is a general principle that I think we need to think about in all the research we're doing. But for today, case study research, I think, presents a real easy way for us to do great work that is published that has a real impact. And so Emerald has invested in this. The AACSB, some of your schools may be um, uh, accredited and part of the AACSB network. Uh, and you'll know that AACSB has focused in their uh, accreditation standards on this question of a broader stakeholder engagement around our research. Other organizations like the RRBM, Responsible Research in Business and Management, a gathering of scholars, have made similar arguments and have been some of the thought leadership behind this idea of doing management research that, that makes a bigger impact. And so case studies certainly fit very strongly into the thinking of these global organizations. I want to share with you two or three thoughts here from some of the thought leaders in our world right, Clayton Christensen um, and Michael Porter and others who have made similar arguments in the past and give us examples here of how our work can be so much better when we embrace good quality case research approaches. Here in the short quote from an MIT Sloan interview that Clayton Christensen gave a few years ago, he spoke about uh, the, the modeling and scientific or, or quantitative work 
it's all science, but the quantitative work that he was doing and how that was useful, but really sitting across the table and engaging with people in Silicon Valley and other manufacturing organizations gave him the opportunity to really think more clearly and deeply about the phenomenon he was studying. Uh, and, and you'll see him talk about that uh, here with the disk drive industry. Remember disk drives? The disk drive industry that he's, he talks about here in this interview. Similarly, uh, Greg Fisher uh, from South Africa, who's now at Indiana University here in the US, uh, editor of Business Horizons, uh, has been arguing very forcefully and effectively over the last few months and years about the need for us as business professors to be strongly connected to business and that our research and our writing should inform business practice in a much clearer and stronger way. And so you can see this come through in one of his recent editorials as well. Um, the American Marketing Association, the Journal of Marketing, similar ideas here from the editors recently, arguing for the role of case studies in documenting and codifying good business practice and then generalizing that to the theory, as Robert Yin says in the case research book, we generalize to the theory. We don't generalize to a population, we generalize to a theory. And so as we generalize to a theory through our case research work and the case studies that we write across Africa, we're able to inform good theory and great practice. And so you're seeing that come through from a number of angles. And here's Michael Porter's quotation, Kind of talking about the same thing. He spoke at the North American Case Research Association, uh, a body that I, I think is a really great platform for many of our case researchers across Africa. I'm the previous uh, president of this organization. And when Michael Porter came through uh, to talk to the group, he spoke about how his work, again, just like Clayton Christensen, uh, really benefited from that combination of good quants and at the same time, good qualitative and mixed method work, especially case studies, longitudinal, in-depth, focused case study work that can then be published and used in classrooms around the world. So my message really here as we kick off the conversation this evening or this afternoon, wherever you may be, is that the work that we're embarking on for this competition, for EMCS, for any case publications that we're involved in. This work is important. This work is not just part of our jobs as academics, but it is important because the way we educate the next generation of business leaders across the planet must, must involve the stories of Africa, the stories of African businesses. We have so much great innovation and creativity and smart operations and, and, and innovative uh, financing models and technology platforms that are leaping uh, over previous technology waves. These are the great practices and theories that we have on the continent that we need to be writing about. Because if we don't, who's going to? And so we need to look in the mirror and recognize that we have an opportunity and perhaps a duty here uh, to dive in and develop these great cases, great research uh, that we can obviously use in our own classrooms. I know when I teach in East Africa, West Africa, Southern Africa, I know that the delegates and students in my classroom really relate to the stories of Africa, from Africa, much more easily than they do to case studies from the rest of the world. Yes, it's interesting to learn a little bit more about Apple or Amazon or Microsoft or Facebook. Yes, those cases are always gonna be in the mix. But how do we compete as managers? How do we prepare our students to compete as managers if they're not thinking about the intricacies of supply chain issues across the almost union of East African countries? How do they compete in the multilingual environment of West and Central Africa if they're not engaging with those issues in the classroom? Uh, and so I know in my teaching across Africa that it's really important to have great cases of Africa, from Africa, and especially written by African academics. We know the context. We live the context. We have colleagues across the corridor that have great insights into the context and the practices. Let's work together to develop these cases. 
Let me dive in for the next few minutes on some of the intricacies that we see in case studies that do better in EMCS, Emerging Market Case Studies, but also in this competition that we run with the African Association of Business Schools. Let's set ourselves up for success as we think about these case studies. On the slide, you'll see that good case research can be published in a bunch of places. We're focusing this afternoon on discussion-based cases on the right-hand side. So cases where we tell a story, a scenario, in eight pages, we set it up for students to solve, there's a very clear dilemma or decision point at a point in time by some, excuse me, protagonists or decision makers where they need to take action. They need to analyze, consider the options and take action. That's a great quality case study because we know in the classroom that engages people and sets them up to apply theory and to think about the frameworks that will help them make better choices. So that's our focus around discussion-based cases. And you'll see it has descriptive elements. We need to tell some story. We need to include the context. We need to provide the facts and information, sometimes not all of it, but enough so that students can grapple with it and make a choice. But it's very much focused about the decision. And so on the far right of that slide at the bottom, the decision is critical. Quality case studies that win these kinds of awards are built around a decision that is core to the case, not just top and tail in the case, not just in the first paragraph and the last paragraph, but the decision that the managers, the owners uh, are struggling with in the case is core to the case. It's fully integrated into the case. We hear in the narration of the case study, we hear about that decision and more information about the decision throughout the case. So that's really important. If I think about cases that do okay in the competition versus those that the judges really feel are the top two or three cases uh, every year in this competition that we run with ABS, uh, the quality of the decision, the extent to which the decision is integrated across the case is one of the key determinants. So keep that in mind as you develop your case, as you do your interviews with the organization, uh, as you refine your case before submission. Style is important. How we write for a good quality case study is different to how we write in some of the other scholarship we do. Here's a quick example. On the left, you'll see one of the articles that I wrote some years ago. Uh, actually, this one's out of my doctorate, published at the International Journal of Sport, Management and Marketing. And you can see in that opening paragraph, typical academic language. We write for each other, right? We write for other academics. We write for other doctoral students. We typically don't write in a very accessible way and we don't write for practitioners. That's part of our lives. Right, that academic scholarly writing. Case study work is built on the same quality research, but it's written in a different way. And so on the right-hand side, you can see the Bright Rock case uh, that Mignon Tendai and I wrote some years ago. Um, Bright Rock, this really interesting life insurance business um, in Southern Africa. And you can see here that the tone, the style of writing is quite different. So we need to put another pen in our hand. We need to think about the genre and the style of writing uh, that is most appropriate for the kind of document we're putting together. The case study narrative of eight pages feels different to other scholarship we may be involved in. So maybe you write it on a different day. Maybe you have a cup of coffee or a cup of tea or something stronger, and then you put your case study hat on and you start writing in a case study way. Maybe as I used to do when I was sitting in the office in Johannesburg thinking about writing cases, I would go online and I'd read the award-winning cases in the Emerald competition. I would read the award-winning cases of some of our colleagues in the corridor um, at the business school in Johannesburg at Gibbs, um, and I would be inspired around style and around structure of narrative. And I'd be in the right mindset to go and write case study. So it is a different way of writing. And we see that come through in some of the submissions. Some of the work that uh, our colleagues are doing across the continent is excellent, 
but when it's written for a case study, it doesn't really capture the style and tone of great communication in a case study approach. So I'm just going to check here uh, if there are any questions coming through. I see none. Uh, please be reminded, as Talita said, that you can post any questions anytime throughout the session into the question tab on your GoToWebinar control panel, um, and I will integrate those as we go. So we're talking about style and tone in terms of the structure of the case. Here's a quick summary, as many of you know, of what we're looking for. Right In any case study submission, it obviously has two pieces. It has the case study and the teaching note. Right, Case study, as we said, signed off by the organization. Students get to see it, typically pre-read it and think about it before they come into the classroom. Um, it includes a management dilemma, or it's actually built around a management dilemma. And there's a protagonist, about eight pages of text with some relevant exhibits. Sometimes we see in the submissions that authors want to include a bunch of things in the exhibits. So I'd be cautious about that. And, and I would ask you to think carefully about the information in the exhibits. Is it really critical to the case? We don't want to just add a bunch of pages because we have it. We want to make sure in our submissions that the exhibits are relevant that they are referred to in the text, that they add data, uh, illustrative examples, something that adds value to the case story. So be cautious about just adding a whole bunch of things um, because there's information that we don't really have to include in the case. So that's the case study document and we, we should all know those really well. The teaching note is the second real determinant of award-winning cases. Writing a great story is sometimes easier for some of our colleagues across the continent. Um, some of us have the gift of the gab. Some of us have a good writing style. We can tell stories well. I mean, when we're teaching in the classroom, we're telling stories. Uh, so for, for many of us, writing the case story is not as hard um, perhaps as it is for others but where we experience more of a challenge is the teaching note and when we look at award-winning submissions the quality of the teaching note is is often one of the strong determinants so that's my second key focus today around award-winning cases uh, the first is the dilemma in the case got to be integrated got to be core the second is around the quality of the teaching note uh, and so I'm going to spend a bit of time talking about the pieces of a teaching note uh, and what kind of contribution it needs to make. It's obviously for instructors only. It's not signed off by the organization. The protagonist does not see it. The interviewees do not see it. The students never see it. It's written for other instructors, other business school teachers who are going to take your case, perhaps on a Sunday night, a few hours before they have to teach on the Monday morning, they're going to select your case partly based on the quality of the teaching note so they can pick it up, they can read it a few times, and they can run with it for a successful case session at 8.15 the next morning. So it's really written with instructors in mind. So you want to make it as simple and clear and useful for instructors as you can. It's obviously built around the learning outcomes. I'm gonna spend some time talking about quality learning outcomes. The teaching plan is critical so that other instructors know what you're thinking when you teach the case. Doesn't mean they have to follow it to the letter. It's a suggested teaching plan. It's based on what's worked for you as you've taught this case in the classroom. But obviously instructors are free to do whatever they want with the case when they use it. The questions and model answers are an opportunity for you to demonstrate your scholarship and understanding of the frameworks and theories and literature that can unlock the issues in the case. And so that's really important. And we look for model answers there that are well-developed, that are almost uh, A plus exam answers. If you were to set those model, the, those questions, those assignment questions, if you were to set them as a post-class uh, assignment paper, 
what would a great version of that paper look like? If you were to set it as an exam question at a business school, counting 60% of the grade for that student in an MBA class, what would a great answer look like? How would a student be able to use evidence in the case to make an argument for a solution to a problem in the case, drawing on relevant literature and frameworks from the learning of the course, right? So think about a memorandum when we set exams as, as, as faculty, as instructors, uh, and think about how we would rate an A answer versus a B answer versus a C answer. What we're looking for in the teaching note is an example of what an A level answer would look like. And so for a page or so of the teaching note, you're answering a page per question, right? You're answering in about a page, you're answering that question thoroughly, comprehensively, integrating good literature and theory and frameworks to provide a model answer, right? Again, sharing with other instructors what a great answer would look like. When a student or students really understand the case, unlock the case, use relevant theory to analyze and draw conclusions and make strong arguments, what does that look like? You're almost developing a memorandum, right, for that model answer. And so that's what we're looking for in the questions and model answer section of the teaching note. And it's about eight pages, it can be more, 10 pages, 12 pages. So there's less of a limit on the teaching note, uh, it's really about the quality. So that was the second point I wanted to emphasize and we'll spend a little bit more time talking about the teaching note and any questions you have about the case or the teaching note, pop them through in the question section here of the GoToWebinar interface. If you haven't yet got a case under development, and you're thinking about, through this webinar, uh, submitting, writing a case and submitting it to EMCS and to this competition for a little bit of cash in your pocket and the acknowledgement and recognition that you've put a great case together that's gonna be used around the world. How do you find great stories? How do you start the process of developing the case? What I've got on the slide is a few ideas that have come out of a number of sessions we've hosted recently and certainly some of the work I've done with my colleagues um, about what seems to work well. And there's two real areas to start with. The first on the left-hand side is a syllabus need, a course need, right? You have a course outline, a syllabus for a marketing class and an MBA that you're teaching um, at Strathmore or Gibbs or University of Cairo or Wits or Cape Town or wherever you might be, and there's a gap. And the case you've used is a little bit old or you don't have a case or some kind of reason you have a gap, right? So thinking about the learning outcomes, thinking about the topic you want to teach in that session, you have the need for a case. And so that may be the driver as you then start scanning the business environment, scanning your contacts, reading the newspaper, and finding those stories that you can then go after in order to fill that gap in your course. So that's a place that a lot of faculty start with, right? They wanna teach a great case from the Congo or from Uganda or from Angola in their syllabus and they need to go and find one to do that. And there isn't one, so they want to go and write it. So that certainly is a driver for many of us. The second driver on the right-hand side is that you're not specifically looking for a case for your syllabus, you're not specifically trying to fill a gap, but you've just read a fabulous uh, article uh, or you've just had a wonderful conversation with an alumni or a consulting assignment or someone you just bump into that you know in some networking event at your business school. And you've just heard a really interesting story about a decision they took, a problem they faced, something they had to deal with, and they prepared to talk some more about it. That's a great opportunity. And for many of us, we have more of those opportunities than we have time to write cases. Uh, and so if you put yourself out there as a case writer, and you're engaging with people on a regular basis about the things that are interesting 
that that, hap that is happening in their organizations, sometimes these just come to you. But that's a second place to think about developing great cases. And so as you think about your pipeline, perhaps for this year's competition or next year's competition, uh, think about where are these case ideas coming from? Are you trying to fill a gap, which is great, yeah, more directed approach, or are you just open to those interesting stories and opportunities that you fall over in your day-to-day -day work? Both of those can be really important. Think about the contacts you have, think about the relationship you have with business, right? We're business school academics. We're in departments of management and business and economics. We're in business schools. We should be close to business. And the closer we are to business, the more opportunity we have to study and research and write about business. So nurture those contacts, develop those relationships, think about good quality sources as you work through these examples. Gathering data. Right, you've, you've identified a case opportunity, it's come to you in an interesting way. Now, how do you gather what Yin calls a case study database? So Robert Yin uses this term case study database. And what he's really referring to when you read his book is a set of mixed method data, right? Quant and qual data from multiple sources, some primary data, that you gather yourself by going and talking to people and doing interviews and getting their permission for that interview and you're recording it and you're transcribing it and that's primary data. Observations can be another type of primary data. You're going to the factory, you're going to the office, you're going to the retail store and you're looking around and you're taking pictures and you're taking some video with their permission and you're also taking some field notes of what you're seeing. How are people interacting with each other? What's the hierarchy? How busy are people? Uh, what's the organizational process playing out in front of you? Are you invited to sit in on a meeting, uh, sit as an observer in a board meeting, in a management meeting, and think about the processes involved and the relationships and the tensions and all of those good things we study? So all of that is primary data and can be part of a case study database. But of course, there's also secondary source information. And cases are often exceptionally well written from secondary sources. If you're able to do both, primary and secondary, it often results in a knockout super great case. But you don't have to. We've seen great cases developed only from primary sources, although those are sometimes missing a little bit of external context which secondary sources give you. So I'd be a little bit cautious about primary cases only developed from primary sources. It's always good and easy to bring in some secondary sources to provide a more objective, independent voice in the case. Can you develop a case just from secondary sources? Yes, absolutely. We've had award-winning cases just developed from secondary sources, but one of the most tricky pieces with secondary source cases is developing the character of the protagonist. You're not able perhaps to interview the protagonist. You're not able to talk to her or to him. So how do you develop the character? Useful secondary sources that can help you with that are interviews the protagonist has given, um, press coverage that the CEO has received, in-depth profile articles, um, uh, congressional or parliamentary or government uh, subcommittees or task forces or reports uh, of, um, of competition commission investigations, anything where testimony is given. Any kind of secondary source data that might be available through your library or might be available via our friends at Google um, that provide you the words or insight into the beliefs, actions, and, and words of the protagonist or the characters. Those are really useful secondary sources. And uh, I've seen a number of really good cases come through EMCS in the last while where authors have successfully drawn from those kind of sources 
to bring the voice of the protagonist, the voice of the character, through quotations into the case. But they didn't interview the protagonist themselves, and that's okay. So, first prize, um, and perhaps the easiest way to do this, is some primary data and some secondary data. Pull it together. As you can see here on the slide, there's a bunch of different places and sources and ways of doing that. But you can do it with primary sources only, but I would include a, a secondary source or two. Otherwise, it feels as though it's just the voice of the company. It feels a bit one-sided, and you want to make sure it's objective and balanced. You can do it only from secondary sources, but make sure you're putting enough attention on developing the protagonist. So types of sources matter. Here's a quick summary of some of the quality points that we've spoken about. The opening section is really important. Those first two or three sentences, make sure you're focusing on the protagonist and the dilemma and where and when. So the CEO, she was um, in her office uh, in Lagos, uh, 5 p.m., watching the traffic outside on a warm summer's day, and she was considering the financial statements in front of her, uh, some kind of dilemma around accounting or whatever it might be. All right, set the case up right from the start in those first few, first few sentences. We've spoken about the narrative on the slide. You can see past tense throughout. If the CEO has an issue that she is facing in March 2022, then everything else in the case is in the past tense because it's before March 2022. There's no other information that can be in the case after the decision point. So be very careful about present tense. We don't want to see present tense in the case. It's a past tense story because it's all happening in the past. End notes and sourcing, good referencing, storytelling flow, dilemma, we've spoken about that. Uh, good editing, good language. Make sure you write it for someone anywhere in the world that can pick it up and they would recognize it as a good quality written document. So those points we should know well. Let me spend the last few minutes of my comments today before we open up to any questions. And I know James wants to share some really cool ideas with you as well around the teaching note. And here you can see the typical sections on the slide of a teaching note. The synopsis is a really cool summary at the top of what the case is about and what students would get from the case. Learning objectives are really critical because they tell instructors what they can use the case for. The way I like to phrase it is at the end of this case discussion or this case session, a successful student will be able to do what? So focus on the verbs, focus on the actions. What will a student be able to do? Quality cases that get through to those top two or three places in these awards are those that consider higher order thinking skills, not just understand or know. At the end of this case, a student will know Porter's five forces. Mm, not really shooting the lights out, all right? At the end of this case, a student will be able to analyze an industry uh, and deduce or conclude uh, the most profitable location within that industry for a given business. A little bit better. At the end of this, case session, a successful student will be able to interpret information about a, an industry and propose um, the location of a business within a supply chain or value chain, right? I'm kind of making this up as I go. But what I hope you can hear is when you think about Bloom's taxonomy of learning outcomes, when you think about the kinds of skills and capabilities that we want to de be developing, in students in Africa and around the world, let's focus a little bit more strongly on developing good quality learning outcomes. They do matter. The target audience is obviously related to that. Your learning outcomes for an undergraduate class is different to your learning outcomes for an exec ed, executive education, corporate kind of program. Research method we've spoken about, laying out the kinds of sources and the kinds of data that was used. The teaching plan, 
be very clear about the plan for how you would teach the case and award-winning cases over the last couple of years certainly are including face-to-face in-person teaching options as well as remote online options and perhaps even what we call hybrid or high flex options where as we know right now it's a little bit tricky and we have both in the room we have some screens in the room because we have students uh, sitting at home uh, recovering from illness and we have some students in the room some of the toughest teaching we're doing right now is balancing those two hybrid high flex kind of modalities let's put that into our teaching notes so that we can help instructors teach our case across multiple modalities let's make it as easy as possible for instructors to pick up the case and use it in a remote classroom and then on the next page learn how they can use this case in a physical classroom with buzz groups and breakout rooms in the classroom and debates and role plays in the classroom so how we do that remotely on zoom or webinar versus how we do that in person versus maybe how we do that in a hybrid structure much tougher so the more we can include about teaching plans across multiple modalities the better quality your case is I've spoken about assignment discussion questions and model answers a critical part of the teaching note and sometimes five six seven pages of your teaching note are your questions and well-developed model answers the epilogue or postscript uh, is what happened in the case so the CEO in Lagos at 5 p.m. looking at those financial statements what should she do in the teaching note in the epilogue and postscript it talks about what she did right not necessarily that it was right or wrong but what did she do and perhaps why did she do that and what were the knock-on effects of what she did so it's the answer to some extent of the dilemma in the case but not the answer as in the right answer it's the answer uh, in terms of what the organization actually did why do we include that well like you've experienced perhaps many times in an MBA classroom or some other kind of business classroom the students really want to know right they've spent 75 minutes thinking about this case study and debating it in the room and you know throwing ideas around now they want to know what did they actually do and some will jump onto Google but Google doesn't always tell them what really happened and so in the epilogue and postscript it's a great opportunity in the last five minutes of any case conversation for the instructor to say this is what the CEO decided to do not that it's the right thing she did but this is what she decided to do and why and how does that relate to the ideas that were coming up in the classroom as the students put themselves in the shoes of the CEO the exhibits in the board plan again really helpful different kind of exhibits these are teaching plan related exhibits so uh, if you're teaching via Jamboard or Google Docs or you're using polls in zoom or poll everywhere any kind of those remote teaching tools let's put some of those in and examples of how we do that if you're teaching in person with a whiteboard or a blackboard or a green board or some other funny color board how would you lay out the case uh, in the room what notes would you make where how would you use flip charts so those kinds of board plans are very very helpful uh, and they lead to better quality cases all right I've been going for about 40 minutes so let me start wrapping up here uh, here's an example of Bloom's taxonomy um, which many of you know if you're not familiar with pedagogy andragogy learning theory I suggest you spend an hour or so just jumping into some basic resources about this we have great resources on the EMCS website Emerald publishing case focused emerging market case studies and the case journal we have really good resources uh, on how to develop great cases including how to think about learning outcomes but there's certainly lots of great books and articles about Bloom's taxonomy the revised Bloom's taxonomy and other ways of constructing great learning outcomes take a look at this it really does help structure a smarter teaching note for a case case study analysis we know that a lot of that happens in the classroom let me end off with this slide as I start wrapping up here these this is kind of our checklist right the checklist 
for you before you submit to EMCS, before you submit to this exciting competition as you think about polishing and refining your case before submission. To what extent does the case study develop the characters dealing with these interesting issues? Make sure that your story comes alive through those characters, that students can identify with, that there's what's called relatability, right? One of the most important elements of any storytelling, relatability. Have you done that in the development of the characters? Is there a very clear decision or set of dilemmas that's core to the entire case? As I mentioned before, that's my number one driver of a quality case submission for this competition. Think about the decision, think about the dilemma. Have you leveraged different sources? Yeah. What does that case study database look like? How are you using those different sources to tell the story in a compelling, data-rich way? Think about the sources. Have you structured the story and have you presented it and written it in a professional, clear, first English language kind of approach. Uh, make sure that it is uh, clearly understood. Clarity, fluency is really important. Um, if you need assistance with that, get an editor, get a colleague to help you, have something proofread. Make sure that the technical writing aspects are good, clear writing so there's no errors to speak of. In the teaching note, learning objectives, develop those well. Think about the teaching plan, assignment, model questions, and model answers. You've heard me talk about all these pieces, and then in that analysis, in those model answers, you've leveraged good theory, frameworks, uh, literature that can be useful to students. So I hope this is a useful checklist. This is a bit of a summary of my last 40 minutes of comments, and so I strongly encourage you to take advantage of these opportunities. As I said up front, we have a massive opportunity to infuse the classrooms of the world with great African case studies, written about African managers and entrepreneurs and owners, written by African faculty. So I look forward to working with you on this, uh, helping you think through your cases, uh, setting you up for success in this competition, and in publication after that. So, Talita, let me pause there. I think I'm handing across to James uh, for some additional comments, uh, and obviously happy to take any questions anyone has as we go. Thank you, Michael. Oops, start the presentation. James, we will start. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Talita. And hello, everybody. Um, uh, I'm going to very briefly talk about really the submission process to, to the ABS competition. So uh, I'm James Hobbs and I'm the commissioning lead for cases here at Emerald. I started at Emerald in November 2021, so I'm still fairly new to the role. Nevertheless, I'm happy to field any questions that you may have throughout this presentation. And there will be a section at the end uh, for any questions that you have. Plus, you can note down my email, which is on this slide here, if suddenly a question uh, comes to you at uh, some point after uh, I've finished my presentation here today. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the following slides do contain uh, a number of links to Emerald web pages for submitting and preparing your case. Do not worry about noting all of these down as we can make sure that you are supplied with uh, these links after we've closed the webinar. Um, um, firstly, I should go into some information about the Emerging Markets Case Studies Collection or EMCS uh, is known as. Uh, EMCS is part of Emerald's proprietary collection of cases products. It offers new perspectives in, uh, in emerging and developing markets. Its scope is indexed. All accepted cases are fully double blind peer reviewed and only cases of a high quality will be accepted into it. Uh, cases from all business and management disciplines are welcomed. Every published case to EMCS receives £100, uh, pounds sterling, so even if you're not submitting to a competition, you're always in line for payment, even if, you're, uh, if your case is accepted and published. We welcome cases at any point. You don't need to wait for a competition to launch uh, to submit an EMCS, but the reason why you're here today is because you're looking to submit to the ABS competition. At Emerald, we are not just on the lookout for cases, but for reviewers too. Should you be interested in being a reviewer, please do let us know. 
it can often be a great way to understanding the process cases run through and sharpen your own skills in writing effective case studies and teaching notes. I've included links to the collection here. Uh, do check these out as these showcase the, showcase the best cases from EMCS and reveal exactly the kind of case that we're looking for for the ABS collection. Uh, next slide, please. So submitting to the uh, to uh, EMCS and the ABS competition overall could not be easier. Uh, you'll need to log into the EMCS Scholar One submission site and select the option of ABS 2022 uh, ahead of submitting your case to us. Uh, most of you may well be uh, have used Scholar One before, so it's a very straightforward system. Uh, what will also help further in uh, in your sending your case to us is following the author guidelines which are available on the main web page for EMCS. Follow these to the letter and the process for approving your case becomes a lot easier. Please do remember the key principles to a good, good case. A good case should have a developing and emerging markets focus, be based on a real situation in a real company with a clear decision making situation and ensure all necessary permissions have been cleared prior to submission. And also make sure it's been tested in the classroom before submission as well. Uh, ensure that all of these are in place and your case has a much higher chance of being accepted. Uh, the ABS competition does have a final deadline. Whilst it may seem some time away for now, please do not be complacent as that time will come around quickly. Please ensure that your submission is sent to us by the 30th of September 2022. On occasion, deadlines can be extended, however, there is no guarantee to this. So please do make sure you get your case to us uh, in that time to avoid disappointment. Uh, the total prize fund for the ABS competition is $2,250 with a $750 first prize to the winner and $500 each to the two runners up. Uh, this competition also features a prize for the best case award and best case proposal, which, uh, is, all, which is also open to submissions. There's a prize of $250 each for these uh, combined with the £100 sterling that you can receive for being published in EMCS, there are plenty of financial incentives for entering the ABS competition in 2022. Finally, I should draw your attention to the Emerald Cases Hub. Uh, Emerald is proud to support their authors through the hub, which contains courses to help you write better cases. Uh, launched in 2020, it includes useful e-learning resources on the case method. Uh, the first phase focuses on writing cases and includes uh, videos and interactive guides on every stage of the case writing process from thinking about writing a case and selecting a topic right through to submission and revising a case based on review of feedback. We then added modules on how to teach using cases in, in the second phase and most recently added a course on how to teach online with cases as we understood faculty around the world have been required to move their classes online often with very little time to prepare. All of the content on there has been developed with help from editors of both uh, EMCS and uh, the case journal, case collections. So it's a great place to hear directly from our editors on what they're looking for. The closer you follow their recommendations, the more likely it is that your case will be accepted. And final slide, please. Uh, well, uh, yep, thanks for your time today. Uh, we can now open the floor to any questions that anyone may have. Uh, we can check the chat box for those if anyone's got anything to add. All very quiet in there. I'll mention one common question that does come up, and that is whether you can enter the competition more than once with, with, with different cases. And the answer to that is yes. Yes, if, if, as long as they're uh, different cases, uh, they haven't been published elsewhere. Yep, you can double your chances by, by submitting a more, more than one case into the competition. James, I'd love to hear from people where they're based uh, today mm -hmm. and, and what kind of companies they might be thinking about writing. Uh, so maybe they want to post that uh, in the question area, uh, ideas about geography, ideas about companies, uh, and, and perhaps we want to use a little bit of the time to, to workshop some of those and develop some of those ideas. Uh, mm -hmm. And of course, any other questions that anyone has. So who wants to dive in and let us know uh, where they're sitting and what kind of companies they're thinking about? We'll give a prize. We'll come up with a prize for the first person who I see a question from. <laughs> oh, 
not big typers today. No. <laughs> That's why one, one question has come through. Hello, hello, will this presentation be available after the meeting? Yes, yeah, we, we tend to put all of these um, all these presentations up on YouTube so you can watch them again. You can dip back to the bits that you may have missed. Um, yeah, it will be made available um, uh, on YouTube. Sounds good. And I see a question here from, uh, is it uh, Sefilu Lua uh, Badaru? Uh, what are the key ingredients needed to prepare a case study question? Um, so I think you're asking about, well, you could be asking about interview questions of the protagonist when you go and do the research, or you might be asking about questions in the uh, in the teaching note, assignment questions. So I'm not sure exactly what kind of questions you're asking about, but let me kind of talk about both briefly. In terms of doing the research, when you want to go out there and gather primary data from characters, protagonist, decision makers. Uh, I would say that, number one, you should do a little bit of homework before, ah, oh, there we go, it is the, is this in the, interview, the interview questions. Okay, yes, interview questions, okay, so both, good. Uh, so, so thank you, I, I see you've clarified that in the, in the chat. I would always do some homework on the organization and the person and perhaps the issue before I go and meet with them, before I jump on the phone with them. And I, I do that because I want to be as informed as possible before I have the conversation so that I ask better questions, so that I can check my understanding of some of the facts, and so also so I can check whether someone is telling me something that's truthful or not. Um, so I want to do as much homework as possible, and I would probably spend a few hours reading secondary sources before I pick up the phone or before I go and meet with someone. My questions that I'll have on my little notebook when I do meet with someone is a combination of two kinds of questions. The first are context questions. So tell me about uh, the issues the organization was facing. Tell me about what you were most excited about uh, around that decision or whatever it might be, right? So I want to understand a bit more of the context. Um, where did that decision fit within the strategy? Where did that year fit within the plan overall? What was kind of going on around the time? So those would be more context-related questions because I obviously want to write that into the case. And they sometimes get some great quotes from people when they're talking about, oh, um, oh, what did I hear the other day? I heard a protagonist in an interview that Anthony, Prang, Anthony Wilson Prangley and at Gibbs in South Africa and I were doing a, are doing a case. And the protagonist said, um, oh, we have competitors with a heartbeat. Right, we have we have real competitors. We we have competitors that are alive and kicking, and it was a great quote to, to think about the competitive landscape that this entrepreneur was facing. So so that's the first kind of question I would ask. The second kinds of questions that I would ask are more specific to the dilemma, to the decision. So I would want to understand um, what did the person consider when they made that decision. Take me into the room. Take me into their thinking. Um, how long did that did it take to make that decision? How difficult was it to make that decision? What did they consider? What were they afraid of? Um, did, did anyone disagree with them about that decision? Uh, did they come to a point where there were two or three options and they were deciding based on some key data or something? So the first kind of questions would be more general context questions. The second bucket of questions would be more specific around the decision. Um, when I go in, it's about a conversation. So I don't go with like 20 questions and I say, question number one, da -da 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 -da. question number two. How I typically do it is more conversational. I have an idea of the kinds of questions I want to ask and I weave those in because I'm trying to build a relationship. I'm trying to create a situation where the person's prepared to talk to me openly about the issues they were facing. Let me talk briefly about the second potential issue here around questions, and that's in the teaching notes. How do we develop those questions? 
there should be a flow or a thread or an alignment consistency between the learning outcomes and the assignment questions and then obviously the model answers so if i have a learning outcome about interpreting industry dynamics and competitively locating myself within a rivalry kind of porter's five forces if i have a learning outcome about that then i would have an assignment question that would might perhaps be uh analyze the industry that the company finds itself in uh, and comment on the choices the company made about where they locate themselves within the value chain so the question should flow from the learning outcome obviously we answer that question fully in the model answer in the teaching plan we ask questions in the room that are related to that assignment question but sometimes are not exactly that assignment question um, because we can ask it in different ways and what i would encourage in the teaching plan are in class case debate questions prompts triggers that that facilitate a good conversation in the room and those are typically, you know, sometimes yes, no questions, sometimes open ended questions. Sometimes we turn the heat up by being very specific in our question. Sometimes we turn the heat down by being more general and let people reflect a little bit in the room. So that's about your style of teaching, your craft, your skill as a teacher to use different kinds of questions in the teaching of the case. So we have questions that we're going to ask. In an interview when we're doing the research we have assignment questions uh, in a teaching note and we have teaching plan questions that we use in the room and i hope that gives you a sense of those different types uh, i see paul is here from nairobi that's very cool paul uh, what kind of companies paul are you thinking about writing about i've seen some great cases about safaricom uh, there's probably some good cases needed about other uh, fintech players within the, the Kenyan space. Uh, very interested in some of those state-led businesses. I think about the rollway business. I think about the stadium with Chinese investment. So, Paul, some really interesting cases that you could be writing. Paul's question here. Uh, can, case, can study do the case as a group? Is there a maximum number of cases from one university? James, I don't think we put a max on submissions from an institution, right? I, I think we want to see, yeah, I think we want to see uh, submissions from many countries and, and many institutions. So, Paul, I, I don't think we would set a maximum there. Um, and, and I do see, Paul, that often we have groups of authors that work together on cases. I have some co-authors that I typically work with, uh, some in Africa, some in other parts of the world that I develop some of my cases with. And so we all have our own style and, and work together with people. I've also seen very effective um, use of students. Uh, as, so writing cases with students, um, uh, Ashraf Shreta, I think it is in Cairo, I'm not sure if he's on the call, um, he's got some really good experience at the uh, American University, I think in Cairo, um, of working with students to develop cases as part of an assignment, as part of a class project, they do some of the data gathering, he works with them as a group, we put a case together, they submit it, and so they might have four or five authors on the case um, with, with Ashraf and then some of his students. So that certainly works well. Um, so I think that's where Paul's going there as well with the group, so that makes sense. Paul's other question here, is the teaching note meant to guide the instructor when guiding the students participating in the competition? Uh, so, so Paul, there are a couple of different things here. Uh, yes, the teaching note is meant to guide the instructor in teaching the case. So that's what the teaching plan is for, the learning outcomes, uh, the model answers to the assignment questions. Yes, that's written for the instructor uh, and it's meant to guide the instructor. 
when we teach the case, we're using parts of that teaching note, but we're never sharing the teaching note with the students. So the teaching note shouldn't guide students in any way. It should guide us as instructors, as teachers, on how we facilitate the learning through that case. But there may be aspects of the teaching note that we talk about with students, but we never show it to them. We don't give it to give give them access to the teaching note, but we may share the postscript. We may share uh, some of the model answers in conversation with the students as we look at their answers. Um, the competition here, Paul, that we're talking about is a case writing competition where uh, you, perhaps Paul, and some of your students and co-authors would develop a case and teaching note as a package and submit it for the competition. Um, and, and then it would you know, be judged and peer reviewed and, and, and hopefully published with EMCS. Um, the students that you work with, if they are co-authors, they may also be involved in helping write that teaching note, which would be harder for students to do, to kind of put on a professor kind of instructor hat. Uh, you may need to guide them a little bit more on that piece of the package. Uh, but yes, they would be involved in putting that together as well. Um, and, and so those two pieces are what we write, put together and submit, um, and then it's used in different ways. So Paul, I hope that clarifies for you here. What we're not talking about today is a student analysis case competition. Those do exist around the world um, where groups of students uh, get a case have to analyze it and compete against other students to come up with a great analysis of the case. Those are really useful ways to use cases, but that's not what we're talking about here, Paul. Uh, we're talking about a competition to recognize and reward great case writers, uh, not students in analyzing the case. So two different approaches here. I hope that helps, Paul. Great, so I hope Paul and his students will be able to dive into the Kenyan and East African market, uh, perhaps talk about some of those companies, Paul, that are doing work in Tanzania and Uganda and Rwanda, as well as Kenya. There's some lovely cross-border businesses that are developing in East Africa that we hope to learn more about as well. Cool, so I think those are the questions, James, that I saw coming through in the question area. Yes, uh, two more have come through to me actually, uh, from both from Cebu uh, Zondi. Uh, the first one is, um, which I can answer, is is, e is EMCS um, uh, ranked on Scopus, and the answer is yes. Uh, you can find the Scopus ranking on the EMCS main page, um, uh, and it's it's all there. Uh, the next one is from also from Cebu. It's he asks, has COVID-19 given rise to a pipeline of new case study topics to write about in relation to business failures, those who have been successful and those, those that have failed? So uh, I think, Michael, you can possibly tackle this one. Yeah, COVID-19 is such an interesting phenomenon. I think it, <clears throat> I think it's certainly part of the dilemma of many managers, certainly if you're writing about issues being faced since February, March 2020, um, COVID's in the room. <clears throat> and so it, it's certainly part of the context. What I would be cautious about is dilemmas built around COVID that are more superficial. What I mean by that is um, if, if the response to COVID lockdowns, response to COVID-led supply chain issues, response to COVID-led employee tensions or difficulties. We want, we want to dig a bit deeper into those dilemmas. What we have seen, Sebo, is some cases submitted where it's kind of about COVID, but the, the, the issues are, are, are a little bit superficial. Um, it's you know, how should we deal with this COVID thing? Okay, but, but what are the frameworks? What's, what's the depth issue here? Did this issue exist before COVID and was just, just reinforced and, and made more extreme 
by by what? By by people not being in the office, by a supply chain issue, by a lockdown, by government regulations. You know, what's what's the real issue here? So COVID's I think always in the room in recent cases. What I would challenge you to think about as you write the case is is what's the real issue here, right? Uh, how has COVID accentuated some kind of strategic issue in the business? So so yes, we see it come through regularly, and and what we try and guide authors to do is is think a little bit deeper about how this might play out. I think that there are some really interesting stories that are yet to be told about um, the, 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 the real business issues of understanding consumer demand, of changing consumer preferences, of product innovations, of supply chain and logistics uh, and operational issues. I think about how some organizations have really pivoted uh, pivoted to online. Um, uh, I think, you know, in Southern Africa, I think about 6060 in the retail space. Um, and I know in many other parts of Africa as well, we've seen a, a shift towards home deliveries. And what has that meant to the, the e-commerce infrastructure? What has that meant to the logistics and operations aspects? What has that meant to customer perceptions of value propositions? So I, th I think there's some depth opportunities here um, to 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 really kind of write some interesting stories in that space. So so yes, I think it's created some new opportunities, um, but I think the challenge for us as case writers is to dig a bit deeper, to scratch below the surface, um, and and think through um, that that issue. Um, obviously, there are you know some really interesting pharmaceutical and medical issues. Um, around uh, responding to COVID at a policy level or a hospital level or a mining or manufacturing or large scale business level. Uh, and, and, and I'd love to see more cases analyzing those situations uh, in, in interesting places across the continent. So, so yeah, I would encourage you to, to dig deeper into that. All right, I'm not seeing any other questions pop up on my side. No, I think that's that's everything that I can see as well that's come through to me. All right. Thank you, Michael and James, for the today. That's all the questions so far. Um, but everyone's got your email addresses if I've got any more questions. And I think this is a wrap up. Thanks very much. Thanks, thanks everyone for joining. Thanks so much. Cheers. Bye-bye. Enjoy, though.